I'm Chanuk Disanayaka, Senior Technical Lead at WSO2. So today I'm going to tell you the story of our digital transformation journey using Corio, a platformless approach. Today we are diving into the world of innovation, where technology is changing everything around us. The way we work, the way we connect with each other, technology is affecting everything. So let's get this journey started, and let's see how digital is reshaping the world. Even though we operate inside the WSO2, we act as a customer of WSO2, we provide different solutions for our internal employees, as well as some of the external parties using WSO2 products. So we have started this journey back in 2014, as you can see, we have used, you, you, you might have already uh, familiar with these products like Enterprise Service Bus, Application Server, Data Service Server. Then we have migrated to the flexibility of private cloud and moving forward to our SaaS offering. Now we even simplified the way of we are delivering the solutions or the internet eliminating the IT infrastructure. Right now, 100% of our internal application, as well as the external developments, are running on top of Corio. Over the past two years, we have done many implementations. Right now, we have around 200 components running on top of Corio and uh, also Asgardio as our identity and access management system. So what, wh what are the reasons that, uh, or the challenges that, we, that made us to do those, uh, made us to take those journey? So as a software company, even though we operate as inside WSO2, we act as a software, software company, we, ha we have a different support account. We don't directly reach to our product teams. We, uh, as a customer, we open a support case. Uh, the only uh, advantage is we have unlimited support towers, so that, that is the only advantage we have. So we, we open a support case, and uh, we resolve that issue. So um, we, what are the challenges we have? We, have the, we had the upgrading products that is a really big challenge because when, when a new product version is released, we have to maintain every and each environment like developer staging production in place in order to make it up to date, as well as allocating resource for that is a tedious task because we as a developer development team, we cannot allocate person for the DevOps task. Then um, especially running legacy applications, Security teams are most of the time uh, in, on our shoulders because sometimes, because of the limitations of our IT infrastructure, we wouldn't be able to upgrade the products on time. Because of the less flexibility and scalability of our infrastructure, we had problems on innovations and barriers to our uh, new business solutions to our customers. Right, so uh, before I'm moving to the actual deployment, I'll speak about uh, the foundation we took in place to, uh, to uh, provide the solutions for our customers. So domain-driven design is the base or the foundation for our deployment approach. So WSO2 as an organization, there are different functional areas like finance, sales, marketing, etc. Each of these functional areas has its own knowledge, which we call as domain knowledge. Right? For an example, if we get a sales domain, in the sales domain, we have a customer which start as a lead, then convert to a contact and to opportunity, ended up, ended up as an account. So this entire context, we can bound together and design a domain model. For that, we get the help of domain experts. What we have done is, as a team, 
we divided our team into sub-teams matching to that domain. So they are closely work with that domain experts with the ubiquitous language. We designed the domain model and we designed the microservices. So which will, that will help us to give better business solutions for our customers because we are closely, with, closely working with the domain experts and the developers who work with those domain experts knows how to give a better solution for them. By using this domain-driven design, then what we have identified is the different type of services or the components that needs to be resides inside our business solutions. For an example, we have identified entity services, integration services, and apps by using domain-driven design. As you can see, these entity services are connected with different SaaS applications as well as domain data servers. These entity services consumed by integrations or the business logic services, which also may be consumed by some of the front-end applications. There are some instances these front-end application could need some data manipulation. In that case, we have a back-end for front-end layer, which consumes those integrations or the business logic layers and provide the required data for front-end applications. So when we are developing those uh, components or the services, component is the concept we use in Corio. Uh, we generally, uh, general term is the service. So when we are developing those services, there's no limitation what are, what, what are the languages that we need in order to develop those services. So we have used Java, Go, Python, Ballerina, even React to um, develop our applications and the services. Right. So now we have a team in place and we have a domain structured in place, and we have identified the entity services, business services. Now we have a better, we need to have a better way of controlling the, uh, the, the network capability of our business services. In order to do that, we get the help of cell-based architecture, which is supported uh, in Corio, which I explain on later. So, when we get into a cell, cell uh, you, you may have heard of these terms uh, earlier in earlier not, uh, talks as well. So when you get into a cell, it has uh, two ingress gateways, which we identified as northbound and westbound. The northbound gateway allows traffic from internet, as well as the westbound uh, gateway allows traffic from the project or a different cell. So those two APIs we call as the, the public APIs and the organizational level APIs or the enterprise uh, level APIs. Then there are some of the APIs which are not exposed to either organization level or the uh, project level. Those APIs call, which we call as uh, the project, uh, project scope, APIs. So when I ex I'll explain those terms later. So when I get into the deployment of uh, these services, you will get a better idea. Uh, so and there are different uh, uh, controls for the egress uh, cell base cell controls for the egress as well. So we have eastbound and southbound uh, controls. Southbound uh, controls controls the uh, API calls going outside the cell, as well as uh, eastbound uh, controls the uh, network calls go going outside to another cell. So this is a high-level picture of our cell-based architecture in WSO2 organization. Uh, this picture might not clear, so I'll zoom in a bit. So uh, in the previous uh, structure, you can see there are a different set of cells. Uh, those we can identify as web cells or the uh, domain cells. When we move to move forward, 
we have uh, so this is an example. We have finance web cell and finance cell. You can see two separate gateways, which allows the connection between each domain, each uh, cell. Uh, for an example, this ent entity services is connected uh, via the project uh, project level or the uh, westbound uh, gateway to the other cell. So. Right, so we, now we have identified the business services or the entity services and the services we need, and we identified the network boundaries for that uh, services. Now we are going to deploy those services and the components. So Corio provide the best possible way of deploying these services in your organization. When it comes to the Corio deployment, we have, as I mentioned earlier, we have deployed our domain-related services in a different layer. We can, as you can see, it's, it's based on domain services, which are hosted on domain, uh, domain-driven, uh, do, domain-based projects. And we have backend and integration services, which is hosted on different set of projects. And there are web applications as well. All these services and the components are hosted on top of Corio and protected by Asgard US and Identity and Access Management Server. Why we choose GraphQL to uh, written, write uh, domain services? Because sometimes we don't know what the consumers actually need. Sometimes uh, a, we don't have the actual business need of a customer. In, therefore, we, ha we have written, uh, written that uh, way of customers or the uh, the consumers can easily query the data that need that they need, and the uh, the, the second layer or the backend services and the integration services we have used the rest because we know what are the endpoints or the resources that needed for our front ends. So the backend services or the integration services may contain the integration between different SaaS products, or there are some uh, cron jobs or the task as well. Right, so I'll come to the deployment now. So in the deployment, we have our own set of GitHub repositories in place, which is related to different domains, right? So when we are deploying, what we have done is, we have pointed our projects and the component to those GitHub repositories. The Corio does its part, and it will de deploy our services in Corio. So I'll come to the multiple version and the deployment tracks later, which Shankar also explained in his slide. So uh, when it comes to the projects, as, as you can see, we are in the, in the upper screenshot, we are in the WSO2 organization. There are a different set of projects, right? So uh, in the cell-based architecture, I have mentioned the finance and finance web. In here, it represents as a project finance, finance web, right? So one organization can have multiple projects. WSO2 as an organization ha has multiple projects. And each of these projects can have multiple components. So I came from WSO2 organization to finance projects. Inside the finance project, you can see there are different set of components which is related to finance domain. One component can only relate to one particular project and a single domain. So, okay, so now I came from organization level to the pro project level and to the component level. Now I came inside to a component, right? Inside a component, we can have different set of environments. Having three different set of environment is a choice made by us. If someone needs a pre-production environment, that, that development team can easily configure that environment as well. In here, as you can see, we have development, staging, and production. Right? So uh, I am an admin of this organization. Because of that, I can see the promote button to stage into production. If, we, if that person is a developer, 
that person can, can't see that uh, promote button. So there are different level of granular level of role-based access control as well in Corio, so which I am not going to cover in this, so it won't be, the time won't be enough. So, um, and also in here, you can see the deployment track, right? In this uh, component, deployment track is pointed to the main branch, and it is 1.0. I'm not sure whether you can see it. So uh, if I need to implement another uh, version of this component, or I need to change the API definition, what, what I, I could do is I can open a different deployment track pointed to the feature branch or the development branch, and it will have the same set of environments which can be consumed by the, uh, the, other, the other external parties as well. So it won't affect this deployment track as well, while the users also can consume the newest or the latest API uh, by, by using these deployment tracks. Right. So now we have set up the organization. We have the projects in place. We have the components in place. We have uh, done all the promotions and all the things are in production. OK, now where do the consumers see this API? There are two places where consumers can find this API and try it and consume, right? So there's developer portal, which is the public APIs are available, and there's internal marketplace, where the internal or the organizational, uh, sorry, organizational level or the public level, uh, project level APIs are available. Both of these uh, marketplace or the portals have se same set of features, like try it, samples, documentations, um, uh, etc. right? So consumers can go to the developer portal and see it, uh, but the internal developers can easily access the marketplace and see what kind of integrations that they can do. Right, now we have done the organization, we have projects, we have now components, we have put it into the marketplace, now consumers have started using it. Obviously, there will be some issues. How we can resolve those issues? That's where the observability comes in handy. Corio has a great observability feature which you can easily find and debug the issues you get from the consumers or their report. So they, it shows the connections between each components as well as what time, what environment, uh, what kind of error it has occurred. There are so many features or the uh, functionalities in the observability area. Right. Now, uh, consumers are consuming it. The observability works fine. All the issues are solved. How the things are happening inside the organization. So as a lead of the WSO2 organization, development platform, I will look into this insight feature, and I check the numbers. I can decide what needs to be improved. How, ca how can I improve my team's performance? How can I give you a better customer experience by analyzing this data? Surprisingly, Corio provides a greater insight of what needs to be done in order to keep everything in place. So that is where the insight comes in. I can easily check for the architecture diagram and see the westbound and northbound connections, which, which are the incoming traffic for the projects, and the outgoing traffic, and what are the project level traffic coming into the cell. For an example, in here it shows for the HRIS domain, there are different set of components connected to the internet. Uh, and there are some of the components resides inside, only, only inside the project, and some calls are coming from the organization level. I can watch this architecture diagram ask from, and ask from the particular developer why this component is exposed to internet. 
that developer should have a, a better answer why they expose this service to the internet. Otherwise, most of the components can be resides within the organization. Right, so I think I'm clear about the deployment. I'll, I'll explain about the deployment again. We have done the domain-driven and identified the domains. We have identified the network capabilities that needs to be uh, handed to the, uh, to the different domains, and we have set up the organization, we have set up the projects, we have set up the components we need, we have set up the environments, and we have done everything perfectly. Our customer has the best solutions that they need. Right, so by using Corio as a platform, what, you have, what we have gained? Obviously, when we are maintaining on-premise product infrastructure, we are involved with maintaining the infrastructure or the platform itself. So we have, this, we have done this calculation around two months back. What we have gained in the HR task-wise or the cost-wise, and how developers concentrate on just doing the development which they are like, which they like the most, right? So over earlier days, they have to done maintaining the product, maintain the IT infrastructure, keep doing the CI/CD deployment uh, changes and manage configurations. Those things are done. Basically, we have maintained the platform as well. Now we have forget about the platform. We can just concentrate on the development. Obviously, platform engineers might be doing this task, which we don't bother about. Right. What we have achieved? As, uh, as I mentioned earlier, we, obviously, we have been able to reduce the cost because we don't um, uh, concentrate on maintaining the platform anymore. And we have fast, faster, better delivery because of the consistency of the environments, especially about deployment tracks, then the, uh, the enhanced visibility and the governance over our APIs, internal marketplace, developer portal, help us to achieve those things, and the better IEM security using Asgard as identity access management. So there are so many things which I didn't mention here, we have achieved by using Oreo and Asgardio as our identity and access management system. To sum up, Oreo has completely changed the game for us. Within the past two years, we have been taken big steps in our digital journey. I'm really happy to say we have done much more releases in a particular period of time rather than the previous years. Even today, we have released as an expense management app as well as done a, a new release of this conference app as well. That is how fast we can do deliveries by using Corio. Thank you for the Corio team and the product teams who made uh, such a great product. And thank you for everyone who's helping us out. Thank you.